Hi, this is Deep Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. Tonight is Tuesday, May 31st, 2011, and our special guest is James, or Jim Bosco, uh, currently uh, doing work for COSA. Welcome, Jim. Yes, uh, pressed the wrong button, but thank you, Steve. Really appreciate your being here. The Future of Education is sponsored in part by Learn Central, the project I work on for Blackboard Collaborate. Blackboard Collaborate is the new name of the two programs that used to be called Wimba and Illuminate that are now part of Blackboard Collaborate. Uh, it's also sponsored by my Web 2.0 Labs project, which is at web20labs.com. Uh, that includes a lot of fun things, including the, the new Teacher 2.0 network. Coming up in Philadelphia for the ISTE conference is our all-day, our free all-day unconference called EduBloggerCon. Now in its fifth year, I think. Somebody can correct me. Uh, Philadelphia, June 25th, 8 to 5 uh, p.m. More information at EduBloggerCon.com. We create the agenda for the day when we're there. It's really a blast. Also, it is to look for the Bloggers Cafe, a place where you can hang out and have access to the internet um, and have lots of fun conversations. And if you would like to present to ISTE and you either weren't accepted or it's a new topic or you just have something you want to say, you can do so at our ISTE Unplugged area. We have a presentation, small presentation area, and we stream all that out through uh, Illuminate. So it's a lot of fun. It's the unplugged.com. We've announced the dates for our 2011 Global Education Conference, November 14th to 18th. That's globaleducationconference.com. Uh, look forward to a really fun event again this year. And as I mentioned, uh, this week are sort of soft launching Teacher 2.0, which is at teacher20.com. This is different than Classroom 2.0. This is specifically looking at helping teachers uh, in their own personal and professional growth using the web uh, and, the, and the new digital media. So uh, it should be a lot of fun. If you're in the Sacramento area, I am doing an all-day experimental workshop on the topic, helping people to build their own um, sort of digital footprint using the web, educators, uh, and feel free to go to teacher20.com and look for the link to the event there. Coming up uh, tomorrow in the Future of Education, we have our unschooling panel. This should be a lot of fun. We're going to be using Clark Aldrich's book, uh, Unschooling Rules. It's kind of the basis of that discussion. Um, but a, a very good group. And then on Thursday, Cal Newport talks about his book, How to Be a High School Superstar, which is not what you think it is, but it's a very interesting look at um, he interviewed students who had done very well in high school over the course of three years. He interviewed them and discovered that, in fact, many of the things we think about success in high school are not uh, what we think they are. So uh, lots of fun. Again, there's more information on my blog or at futureofeducation.com. Uh, the week after that, we are going to interview the authors of The Invisible Gorilla, one of my favorite books of the year. Uh, we're going to look at the, at the cognitive issues associated uh, that they discuss in their book and then associated with how we think about education, both from the perspective of teaching and learning and from the perspective of uh, setting policy. So it should be a lot of fun. And, and many other good things coming up. Hope you'll look at those. Uh, we haven't announced yet, but if you look at July 5th, Sandy Hirsch from San Jose State University's a library program, we're actually going to run a library 2.0 virtual conference in the fall. I look for an announcement about that uh, in the coming week. If you've missed one of the sessions, uh, they are all recorded. Our session with Ken Robinson last week is um, up uh, both in full Illuminate form and the MP3. Steve Denning talked to us about radical management. I keep thinking about Steve's book uh, since that interview. And um, i got to tell you, there's some, there are some deep thoughts that keep coming back to me related to that. Um, so it was well worth the time. Uh, Chris Gillibo. Uh, talked about um, the art of nonconformity. Uh, Mark Fensky on the winter's brain. Lots, lots, and lots of fun. Hope, hopefully, there's something up there that's worth your time to listen to. Oh, Peggy, if you don't know the invisible gorilla, you're going to want to find out about it. It's based on an experiment, a video experiment done with some. You see some uh, people, students playing basketball, and uh, those of you who know, don't give it away. But uh, a 
sort of brilliant look at our the limits of our cognitive abilities and what that might teach us about um, what we think about in education. They don't put that spin on it, but I will. If this is your first time at Illuminate, it is a participatory environment. You have a variety of ways to do so. The first thing I'm going to encourage you to do is go up to View Layouts and select the wide layout. It makes it easier to see the chat. Uh, at the bottom of the participant window, you then have these emoticons, a smiley face, a clapping hand, confused look, or thumb down. You can use those. The hand with the green up arrow, the larger icon, is uh, one you can use to raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question using the microphone. Of course, you can put your questions in the chat just as well. So Greg's raised his hand. Sure you were just testing. Um, right now I'm going to give you a chance to modify the whiteboard and to look to the left of the map for a wand, a little blue stick with a star at the end, and click on that and then click on the map. That lets us know where you're listening from. Feel free to shout out in the chat. <laughs> Carolyn says, there are lots of limits to my cognitive abilities, but fortunately shows such as your stretch them. Yes, and uh, the winner in all of us uh, the genius in all of us um, by uh, Shank, David Shank, uh, was also a really fascinating interview and a, uh, again one of my great favorite books of this year, uh, talking a lot about the plastic brain and our, and our misperceptions of natural talents. So it looks like Phoenix, Arizona, New Hampshire, Michigan, Louisiana, Utah, New York City, West Virginia, Auckland, a couple in New Zealand, one in Australia, Philadelphia, of course. Getting a little Philly anxious. Looking for, looking forward to hoagies and cheesesteaks and soft pretzels. So, Jim, this is really fun for me. Uh, long time coming. I think you and I have uh, been working on a lot of uh, similar and interesting things, and this is a chance to kind of finally um, kind of record a conversation about it. Uh, really appreciate your being here. Thanks, Steve. And um, as I, any opportunity I have to have a chance to talk with you, I take. So uh, uh, I'm very, very happy to be able to spend a little bit of time with you and and uh, all of those participating. Uh, from all over the place. I would have been, uh, Steve, I would have been very happy to have this thing originate in Australia. I was, uh, you know, you'd have provided the, uh, the uh, classroom uh, 2.0 uh, jet for me to go over to Australia. I'd have been very, very happy to start there so our Australian and New Zealand uh, friends would uh, have me a closer hand. Now, where is that classroom 2.0 jet? Well, I know you just keep it for yourself, but uh, I guess I should have blown your blown your cover on that. I apologize. So the classroom 2.0 tricycle does sit in the garage, but it doesn't get me very far. Hey, Jim. So let's start by acknowledging that you've been thinking about computers in schools for a long time. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about your own history and kind of what's brought you to this place? Sure. Yeah, I, that is true. It, it is a long time. Uh, actually, even before computers, I was involved with some of the uh, work that probably, I doubt that anybody even, probably in this group is too young to even remember interactive video and some of the things we were doing with uh, technology uh, even before we had um, uh, the emergence of the microcomputer in the classrooms in the 80s. I was a, a part of that. Uh, uh, actually, uh, one of the uh, one of the tasks I had was uh, I was uh, responsible for the one of the quadrants of the state of Michigan when we first began to connect uh, schools to the internet. Uh, we had uh, we had some funds from an excess charge from our. Uh, a telephone company here, and the state uh, invested that into getting connections for schools, and I work with schools uh, at that point. Uh, my, I am a professor. My, my, uh, my, my job uh, over the years has been as a professor in, at the uh, in the College of Education, Western Michigan University. 
but uh, the way that I have uh, approached my work is by uh, feeling a great need to not be uh, the kind of person that sits in the chair somewhere and comments, like as some of my professor colleagues do, and, and uh, comments on what schools are doing wrong and how they could do it better, and uh, uh, basically from a distance. I have been uh, deeply involved in working with schools. I directed a research center with the uh, Grand Rapids Public Schools. Uh, I've been involved with, um, uh, with, with working as a co-director of, uh, uh, of a school reform project here in Michigan with the, uh, with the high school principal. So my, my work and, uh, has really been uh, deeply involved with schools and with the realities of uh, what we have to contend with. Uh, it, it, it may, in a sense, make it harder for me to uh, do some of the writing and some of the other speaking that I've done because uh, I tend to see, uh, I tend to see the, um, the situation more from the inside and I think oftentimes when you're inside it's it's a lot more nuanced, a lot more complicated than it is when you're when you're just on the outside. Uh, most most currently, uh, as Steve mentioned, I've been directing the a project with Consortium for School Networking, as you see on your screen, participatory learning, uh, leadership, and policy. And the, the 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 fundamental nature of this project is our recognition that while it is certainly uh, uh, the, the critical point in what we do right or wrong is the teacher uh, in the classroom and how they're interacting with their students and how they're actually uh, making a use of these resources, but I guess my own, my own passion for this project is I have been in too many instances where I have seen uh, school policy, school practice uh, to be an impediment for what teachers are doing rather than a, uh, a basis for assisting them. I, I realize that there's a lot of people, especially these days, who are concerned about all the bad teachers we have and how we get rid of them and how we uh, clean out, uh, you know, get rid of whatever, you know, all the, all the get rid of tenure, whatever we have to do so we can fire all the bad teachers. Uh, and I, that's fine for the I mean, people who want to deal with it. Uh, that's, if that's their thing, uh, you know, go to it. My concern is, is more how we support the work of good teachers and how we uh, develop uh, uh, district policy and practices that, that, uh, that, uh, that enable school te the, the effective teachers to do what they're doing, not despite what is the uh, policy and practices at the district level, but even because of it. So that has been the basis of what we are doing. Uh, we work primarily with district level leaders, uh, superintendents, tech directors, uh, curriculum directors. Uh, I have to always be sure that people understand that does not imply that we are a top-down situation. Uh, the idea of those individuals issuing fiats and mandates and sending out sending out memos that can simply uh, take care of everything is is kind of absurd. So that. Um, uh, the, the, it's, it's, as, as others have commented on, is it top down or bottom up? And the answer is yes. It has to be both. But it certainly does have to be uh, involve our, uh, our administration because there are certain things that are, on, that are at their level, on their desk, that individual teachers can't deal with. And so uh, our focus has been uh, working with them. And that is the fundamental nature of the uh, project that we've been working with with the MacArthur Foundation for the past uh, three years, and we are hoping to be funded again. We have to, uh, uh, you know, we have to. Uh, we're, we're waiting to hear from them. So, you know, I'm I'm lighting candles in church and uh, thinking good thoughts about John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur, with the hope that we will be funded. Jim, uh, you also have a long history with COSIN and in particular on the international side. How has that played into this research? Yeah, that is yeah. true. Uh, actually, uh, I was uh, somewhat responsible 
for some of the work we did in uh, with international. Uh, I was I've served on the board and I was uh, uh, board president uh, uh, earlier, and uh, actually during my tenure as board president. Uh, I was uh, I was very concerned because I felt that one of the things that was happening here in the United States among people knowledgeable people involved with uh, uh, educational technology was uh, more of a parochial perspective than it seemed to me that was was warranted. So I um, uh, I. Uh, talked with uh, with Keith Kruger, who was very very supportive. Keith is the CEO of Cosin, uh, and uh, Keith and I, somewhat gingerly really, approached our board to say that we uh, felt we should be establishing linkages uh, with um, uh, with other uh, with with other uh, educational technology leaders throughout the world. Not everybody on our board at that time was supportive of it. Uh, there was concern that that would deter us from the work that we had to do at home. You know, charity begins at home. Why are we uh, Why are we going out there helping people uh, outside the United States? Our point was it's not a matter of us giving a you know a new Marshall Plan for educational technology, but it, it was the sense that we have as much to learn from them at least uh, as uh, as as they have from us, and so it really was a matter of saying uh, uh, we need to we need to establish those linkages, and it has been a tremendously valuable. Uh, it's, it's tr tremendously valuable resource for Cosin, and at this point, it's it's really pretty well established. Uh, we uh, it, it is interesting to see how many of the uh, problems that um, that we are we are faced with here in the United States have parallels uh, in in other countries. However, many of the traditions, many of the many of the cultural aspects in other countries differ from ours. So the way in which they go about it, while perhaps not uh, giving us the basis for exactly how we should do it, opens our eyes and uh, broadens our perspective so that we can look at our problems and our potential solutions. I think in a much more um, in in a much clearer and uh, richer uh, manner than had we, you know, stayed uh, just tightly focused on what we're doing here in the United States, as if uh, as if everything that was good that could ever happen with educational technology was happening in the United States of America. So, Jim, I was at the international symposium, the, the pre-conference day at Cosin this year, uh, with you, and. Uh, it felt to me, uh, I left feeling as though there had been a sea change, that, that from one year to the next, there was a significantly higher sense of the importance and value of Web 2.0 and digital media and social technologies. Was that just my own lens at the time, or did you leave feeling the same way? Oh, I definitely, uh, Steve. I, when we when we started this project uh, with MacArthur Foundation, uh, we uh, one of the first things we did was to do a, a national uh, survey, uh, and we got you know we got information about what was happening with Web 2.0 and and the new digital media, uh, and it was uh, it was not terribly surprising in general because we had actually a great number of people who responded and these are the people responding were superintendents, uh, uh, technology directors and curriculum directors on a basis of a, of a statistical sampling. It wasn't. It was a very uh, carefully done study, which was actually run for us by Cheryl Lemke and Materi. Uh, we so some of the data was not surprising in that uh, there was a lot of apprehension. There was a lot of concern about and 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 even I think to say it would not be incorrect to call it bewilderment about what was what was happening. What we what did surprise us in it was even at that point. But three years or so back, uh, there seemed to be a uh, much more of a recognition 
that this was not going away, uh, that this was, uh, that somehow or other we had to figure out what to do with it, and not just what to do in the sense of how we could block it and build the, uh, you know, build the moats and the, and the uh, fortress walls, but how we could incorporate it. Uh, there, was, there was that recognition back then. What we have seen uh, in the past year or so, maybe year, maybe the last year or two, but certainly not much longer than that, and maybe even a little shorter, is a uh, very, very significant uh, change in uh, the uh, the recognition of uh, of the importance. Uh, but even more so, the sense that we have to make some changes. We, uh, you know, we're seeing more schools that are uh, stepping back from their very rigid policies with regard to Web 2.0 and saying, you know, this this just isn't going to work. Web 2.0, and by the way, mobile technologies. Um, you know, sometimes with all the negative stuff that we hear in the in the uh, in the media and all the you know the bad stories, you think, well, there's you know there's it's unlikely that anybody is going to that anyone any districts are going to want to you know move into this if if they haven't already been doing so. But we're not seeing that. We're seeing a um, we are seeing that sea change. Something is happening. I would not go to the extreme and say that it's a universal thing. Uh, there are still many schools districts that are, are looking pretty much like they would have looked five years ago. But uh, we are seeing these, uh, we are seeing pace setter school districts, uh, school di districts where there is leadership at all levels that are, uh, that are stepping out from the uh, from the pack and saying, uh, we have to, this, this is, a, a, this Yes, the re this resource does provide problems. There, there, there are things that we have to contend with. Uh, uh, so it's not a naive, just uh, jumping on the bandwagon. But it certainly is the sense that um, we have to find ways to make use of these resources for our kids in our schools. We just can't. Uh, we, we would be, we would be seriously uh, deficient for us to just keep, uh, stick our head in the sand and say, uh, you know, this, uh, let's hope that this goes away. Because it's not going away, and the opportunities that it provides for our kids are just uh, too good to miss out on. So I remember, as, as you were recounting that history, I can remember getting my first computer at work. And we've told this story on the show several times with several different people. Uh, and how that sort of dramatically changed what we did at work, but how the computer kind of sat in the back of the classroom or was in labs and didn't really dramatically change what happened at schools. Larry asks in the chat, are we trying to fit technology into the way schools work now, or can we let technology change how students learn and adjust teachers and staff to the learning needs of students at many levels? And inherent in that question is kind of the sense that that these new technologies, the social technologies, are so transformative that they could actually reshape education rather than just being integrated into it. How would you respond to that? Well, uh, I'm not sure where Larry is, but it's good that we're not in the same room because I probably jumped up and went over and hugged them actually uh, for that question because I think it is exactly right on target in terms of what the fundamental issue is. Uh, I have I have uh, oftentimes been uh, somewhat uh, and deliberately uh, feisty in some of the times when I've talked with uh, schools and, and, and teachers, and I have I have uh, I have expressed my chagrin about the idea of integrating technology uh, into into schools. Now I know what. Uh, what some people mean by this, they really mean get it used in schools. But the notion of integrating goes right to the heart of Larry's question. Uh, if if we approach this uh, uh, in a way where we say our task is to figure out how to fit this in to what we have been doing in schools over the past 150 years since the uh, invention of the uh, uh, the public school. Uh, I think we are on a um, we are we're on a on a path 
that may have some marginal value, but in no way would enable us to take full advantage of what resources we have. So the real task is the real task is to change our thinking about uh, about the role of teacher, the role of student, about how we think about uh, teaching and learning, and uh, to use uh, the technology as a as a as an element in rethinking and re uh, reinventing uh, how we go about schooling. Some people tell me, a that is impossible. Uh, we've been talking about change. You know, there's been there's been better people than you, Jim. I'm told who've tried to pitch that uh, uh, pitch that message, and you know, it's schools don't change. Uh, uh, others others say uh, others say that um, uh, the 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 notion of uh, uh, of taking of making these changes will take. Uh, will be a very slow process. It'll be evolutionary. and It'll have to take lots of time. I'm very impatient. I've been listening to the evolutionary story for a long time. And frankly, from 1980, we were talking about that in the 1980s. And uh, in general, the evolution that's occurred has not really been terribly, ex uh, terribly uh, uh, extensive. So uh, I think really what it in what's involved is uh, assuming that we're, our task is not simply to uh, uh, sell technologies to schools and get them used in whatever is the easiest way for that to occur, but if our task is to take advantage of the technologies to, to move in a new direction, uh, which I think is called for, then yes, Larry, Larry, you're exactly right. That's what we have to do. Uh, so that gets at policies and practices. And by the way, it gets at something else, which is kind of a pet peeve of mine. Going to all these uh, technology conferences and hearing all the, you know, all our world experts talk about these. I very seldom hear anybody talk about uh, uh, the in a serious way about the school as an organizational structure. You know, we hear a lot about professional development. And you know the, the 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 notion is if you you know if you give teachers professional development and you send them into the schools somehow or other they will this, the organization will change to accommodate them. I have that's not been my experience. I've seen too many teachers who have the capability uh, where the where the contest is between the organization and the teacher. I'll bet on the organization to win and not the teacher. Uh, we have sometimes heroic teachers who can turn it around and who are who are so uh, you know who are so passionate and capable and energetic. But uh, that's that's really expecting a lot, and I think it's expecting more. So we have to approach the issue of organizational change uh, face on. Uh, much as we have in other sectors of society, much as we have where we've really made uh, extensive use of uh, uh, technology uh, in in the uh, in the private sector, in uh, healthcare, and a whole variety of other sectors of society, uh, they did not just dump computers into the into the uh, into the uh, the business or the organization, or or, or and and then uh, somehow or other. Uh, uh, a, a new world emerged. Didn't happen that way, and it's not going to happen that way for us. Yes, and by the way, the uh, the, the organization does frequently uh, Deb, uh, the organization frequently does uh, cripple the teacher, and and uh, uh, we have to deal with that explicitly. I think this is in part why I'm so interested in the cognitive issues from the policy side. Um, if, disruptive if the theory of disruptive innovation is that it's very hard for existing organizations to adopt uh, new practices that are going to become the standard, uh, and that these practices evolve on the outskirts, the ones that actually gain momentum then uh, inform or reshape the inside, um, are we seeing in social media and Web 2.0 and digital media, are these disruptive technologies? Or are they going to 
end up kind of um, creating change processes that may be a little bit painful? Uh, you know, it is um, going through the process of making these changes. Uh, again, if you're if you're you know if you're making a Hollywood movie out of them, and you have heroic people who are who are involved in in making these things happen, and which by the way happens in a lot of schools. We have we have lots of heroic teachers, uh, lots of heroic principals, uh, as someone just mentioned. Uh, and even heroic people at central administration uh, also who who are trying to make change, but um, being involved in this process only looks good when you're watching it in a Hollywood movie when you're actually involved in it in, if you're really making change and if you're really contesting some of what is there and established, and which, by the way, will have advocates, proponents, uh, and uh, the benefit of inertia on their side, uh, it's not a very pleasant task. It's a very, it's a very, uh, uh, it, it, it's a, in some, many instances, it's a very unpleasant task. Uh, to to uh, to be involved in making those changes, and you know the the idea of um, of of not lowering your expectation. What what happened to me? What I was very much aware of in some of the work that I've done working in schools, where we've been trying to make these kinds of changes, is is very interesting. We start out, we say, here's our goal, here's what we need to do, and we know very clearly what we're trying to do. When we get in, you know, you get into it. Uh, I've observed this dynamic a number of times. When you get into it, after a bit, you say, you know what? We were kind of unrealistic. Uh, that was not a realistic goal, really. We uh, we have to rethink this. So what we do, and what we can rationalize in all sorts of ways, is we can make the goal uh, correspond to the achievement. So you know, we actually, actually, we were only trying. You know, we said we were trying to get you know 85 uh, percent, but we really 25 uh, percent is damn good. So we we adjust the goal. Uh, the people who make change are the kind of persistent, annoying, difficult people who don't compromise with the goal. And who say this is where we have to go? We have to make these changes in our schools. We have to. We have to. Uh, we're we're not reaching our kids. We have we have substantial number of kids uh, in the, uh, who are in, sitting in our classroom today. We're not reaching, and uh, we have new resources. We have new means that with with the right kind of thinking about learning about. Uh, uh, how we construct learning environments, and with with opening up or somehow or other creating innovative space for us, uh, we the we can accomplish the goal that we set because you know what it was the right goal, and we're not going to lower our goal. We're gonna we're gonna elevate our. Uh, our energy and our passion in in accomplishing that goal. Jim, there's a lot of um, external voice right now about education, uh, venture capital money, uh, research money, um, the billionaire boys club kind of impact. Uh, of those kinds of activities, do you see some that you think hold the potential to make positive differences? Well, I, uh, you know, I, I certainly am in no uh, position to speak comprehensively about all those, uh, all those uh, activities. Uh, I'm not sure I see a whole lot at the federal level at this point that uh, that that. Um, Brings me a whole lot of enthusiasm, and at the state level, uh, uh, also, um, of course, right now the most states, like my state of Michigan here, the the big focus is on uh, on how we uh, how we cut budgets, and um, so the 
talk at the state level, uh, the kinds of conversations with occurring governors and state legislatures a few years ago on 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 trying to make changes uh, is is not really occurring too much at this point. Um, the um, uh, if if I, I I don't know that I would see um, and Steve you're probably in a better position to, to answer that question your own question than I, but um, uh, there you know um, there are some things that I think are are very interesting. One that I that I think has uh, that I. I've recently uh, come across and had some conversation with them was the uh, Stutsky Foundation uh, and some of the work that they're doing um, and some of the work that's occurring. They've got a couple of different projects that, that seemed um, for real to me uh, and one that involves CCSSO, Chief State School Officers. Um, uh, so those projects and and having you know listened to the the rationale and how they're coming at it, um, uh, those were projects that I I'd say um, I think deserve watching. Uh, but um, um, you know that's and again that's another reason why we're interested in the international stuff because. Uh, more recently now, the, uh, a lot of the countries are in the same boat we are, but I mean, we were seeing some very, very interesting things happening uh, in Australia, uh, in the UK, but um, uh, some of that, some of the best things, you know, we, we would come back, we'd visit some of those countries, we'd come back and we're really, we're really jealous about it, but really also glad to, to encounter them because it, it gave us the opportunity to make invidious comparisons uh, with what's happening outside the United States, which sometimes uh, gets people's attention. But uh, some of you know, it's, it's disconcerting because some of the good things we saw happening uh, in projects, in some instances by governmental agencies and other instances by NGOs, seems to have been uh, pulled back. So uh, uh, we're not seeing that. I think the 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 best, the most, the place, the what where I see the most, where, where what what makes me the most optimistic is what I see happening in uh, school districts here and there, uh, the kinds of school districts we were talking about that are starting to break out of the pack. Uh, and, you know, they're not waiting for the feds, they're not waiting for the states, they're not waiting to get a big foundation grant. They're just saying, hey, we got to do something, and they're, they're moving forward. And I think that's, I think that's extremely reassuring and probably uh, the, the, the uh, play, the, 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 uh, the area that is uh, ought to be most encouraging uh, for us to see those kinds of things happening. Some great, some great people who are uh, who are you know tired of waiting for someone else to uh, to do the right thing. They're going to do the right thing themselves. So let's talk about digital media and participatory learning and, and kind of where these worlds meet and maybe your definitions of them. Um, I'm a little bit intrigued by things like Khan Academy because while they are digital, they don't seem to be participatory. So how do you make distinctions and, and sort of what, what are you looking at that you feel is of value in that arena? Yeah, and by the way, I saw, I'm, I, I'm you know, I'm, as I'm, Talking here, I I can't look at all the questions and all the conversation, which I'm uh, it's, it's disappointing me because there's some really interesting things that are crossing by here that I can see from time to time. One thing I did want to respond to first, though, was something that that uh, was was on the uh, on the uh, chat board just a, a bit ago, uh, which is uh, where are the uh, where are those places? Where are those school districts? I just want to say a quick word about that. Um, uh, we have uh, we have informally uh, through our contacts, not through anything systematic or um, uh, you know or or terribly uh, rigorous in terms of uh, selection process. We there have been some districts that have kind of stepped we we felt are, are uh, places to watch. However, what we are going to be doing in our next grant is we are going to be approaching that in a more 
um, systematic way in terms of, of uh, identifying uh, some of those districts uh, and uh, also finding ways to um, uh, in a, in finding ways to take advantage of the what they're accomplishing and what they've learned uh, uh, how to do and how to, how to uh, approach this uh, for you know for use by others who want to learn from them. Uh, I find that when I give you know I can give I can give a PowerPoint presentation and talk about all this stuff, but it, but the the issue often comes down to okay I mean that's nice you know those are those are beautiful PowerPoint screens, but uh, uh, let's get real. Where where actually is this happening? Where you know the, some of the kinds of things you're talking about. That is uh, where we are going to be headed um, uh, very, very soon. Uh, in if 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 uh, as we expect, we are funded. Uh, participatory learning. Uh, the the intersect. Steve, you asked about the intersect between participatory learning and digital media. Um, participatory learning uh, and and other terms that are. You know uh, that kind of fit into that uh, framework, um, such as uh, you know uh, student-centered uh, learning, um, you know, and and um, constructive constructivist learning. Um, that those those concepts have been with us for a long time. Um, one of the things I'm in the midst of uh, writing a book on uh, the history of educational reform in the United States, beginning with, uh, or, and it's really a, a kind of a somewhat of a history of American uh, education, but focusing on on uh, school reform. But uh, in in the uh, in the late 1700s, um, uh, there were there were people. Uh, one of the People, if anybody's taking a course in educational history, may have come along the name of Pestalozzi, uh, who uh, uh, was writing in in many about um, he didn't call it participatory learning, but what he was writing about was very very similar to what we're talking about these days. Certainly, John Dewey was a uh, if you read what Dewey is saying about learning, it is uh, it is very much. In keeping with what we're saying about participatory learning, which means that the student is is um, is not a spectator, the student is is engaged as a creator of their own learning, and uh, and is also um, uh, able to uh, is is not encompassed within the school, so that the kinds of things they do connect with the world. So it is not just for it, it is not learning, so that you can learn enough to pass the next test, which enables you to pass the next test. It is learning that has relevance, meaning, uh, impact um, in in one's life. So that's not a new concept. That is not a new concept. Collaboration is not a new concept by any means. Uh, so, and so some people say, "Hey, look, you know, you're just dusting off all these ideas that people like. You know, the whole string of uh, people over the years. You, you can uh, the long list of people have been saying. So you're just dusting off those terms. So this isn't new." And I say, "Yeah, you're right. It isn't new. What is new is that we now have the kinds of resources to do it. Uh, digital media uh, provides." Um, Provides an opportunity for individuals to collaborate, to participate, to be engaged in their world in ways that are that would have been totally, completely unimaginable uh, uh, ten years ago. So, uh, so really, uh, you know, the the focus then becomes on. Uh, how do we approach this 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 way of creating these learning environments? Same kind of learning environments that people as far back as Pestalozzi and Dewey and William Kilpatrick and a whole variety of others. Uh, how do we approach that uh, now that we now have 
the tools to do it in ways that um, give us capability that I say you know a few years ago we didn't have. Um, but again, here's I mean the thing is this: uh, every school, every you can talk you know every school there is some degree of collaboration, there is some degree of participation, there is some degree of you know every school district uh, uh, just about. Uh, says that they are learner-centered in one way or another. Uh, the problem is not that they're lying, but I think the problem is that many, in many instances, what is defined and what way we're thinking about learner-centered uh, is more along the lines of we care about our lear learners. We're, we're, we're trying to give them the best that we can give them. Well, you know, that's maybe that's one conception of learner-centered. But learner-centered and participatory learning, rep if we really take them seriously, do represent ra quite radical changes in how we think about curriculum and uh, in pedagogy. So one of the things I've really appreciated about the material you've produced uh, as part of the, the initiative is the kind of paralleling of the student experience and the teacher experience and the administrator experience. That in order for these shifts to take place, that kind of learning, support, community, and participation has to exist at each level. Um, and especially, I've appreciated that there were some quotes I took out about um, sort of modeling the use of the technologies and, and developing visions collaboratively. Do you want to talk about that at all? Now that's 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 really uh, is quite important, Steve. You know, when we were when we were uh, when we started working with the uh, you know getting microcomputers in schools in the in the early 80s, and then when we were getting the internet and 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 the web into schools, uh, there were a lot of administrators who approached it in a very uh, you know in a very standard way. That who they you know where where their task was. Uh, to get the get the equipment, to get the money to buy the equipment, and in some and and that, so you know for some that was it. Well, you know my job is to get the equipment, get it in the classroom, and then um you know then it's somebody else's problem. You know the teachers have to then we've given them the we've given them material we've given them the stuff. They they certainly need to find out. Uh, they need to figure out how to use it and use it effectively. Some uh, some administrators went one step beyond that and said, "Well, no, our job is also to find uh, uh, to, to uh, get provide uh, teacher uh, professional development so that they know how to use it. Uh, so we have to find ways of getting the time, resources, whatever we need. Which, by the way, is not I don't I'm not I'm not demeaning that because that is not always a a very easy uh, issue to to solve. It's oftentimes a very tough issue to solve. So you know we did have administrators who went to that second big step, uh, but then that was uh, in a lot of instances that was it. My jobs, uh, you know, my jobs finished here, and I can now turn my attention somewhere else. Um, what what we are saying is that um, uh, no, your job isn't finished. Uh, number one, um, the the issue of policies and practices, going back to what I was saying earlier, that uh, that are that pertain to this that may uh, may be dysfunctional, uh, and certainly the, the kinds of policies that uh, that are contributory to doing the right thing. Uh, you know, you work with the school board; you're responsible for that. Um, so you need to you need to not just walk away from it. It's not a deistic approach where you know God created the universe and then uh, God walked away and said, "Okay, okay, guys, uh, do with it what you can." Uh, so and and you know we do see and I, Steve, I know you see this too in instances where you have uh, administrators, the principals on up. Who who really understand this stuff and who are using it in a substantive way in their own work? For the, for example, you know if you have if you have uh, superintendents or principals who are using uh, digital media, using collaborative collaboratory uh, collaborative uh, media for their own professional development. 
I mean, it's a world of difference then in thinking about how they can understand and what they do to help uh, help uh, that occur for teachers. Uh, in communication with, uh, you know, using various uh, digital media, uh, social media for, uh, for reaching out to the community. Um, uh, when you have administrators who are doing that and who understand it from the ground up, they're just totally different kinds of people uh, when in working with teachers uh, who are who, who get it, and also in helping the teachers who don't get it to grow and extend their own uh, professional capability. So we've had some questions roll in. Uh, my, I'd like to ask first if you could spell the name of uh, that gentleman from the 1700s, Pestazoli. And, and I'm not even sure I'm saying it right, but I'm interested in knowing that spelling. If you'd put it in the chat, Jim. Carolyn asks, can you give a couple of specific examples of model participatory learning adventures? Uh, participatory learning, last, what, uh, participatory learning, what? Adventures, she wrote, but I guess maybe just any uh, model participatory learning ex um, examples. Yeah. Um, okay. The uh, first question. The first question was Pestalozzi, P E S T A L O Z Z I, who, by the way, was very much influenced by another radical uh, uh, Rousseau and his Emile, which was a uh, a scandalous, radical book about uh, you know Rousseau created Rousseau really was created the concept of childhood. Uh, you know he, he got people thinking about childhood as a as a, as a separate state of the stage of development, and the uh, 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 children were not simply uh, 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 adults uh, in training. I mean that they really re represent a unique stage. So that was that was. Uh, uh, so Pestalozzi uh, was influenced by uh, by uh, Rousseau. Uh, the uh, uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not actually real sure about the uh, participatory learning uh, ventures. Uh, what I I guess um, also I'm not sure if I'm I'm on target here, but. Uh, we, you know, one of the things that uh, one of the things that uh, is happening, and uh, I think a good a good source. I, I don't have it at my fingertips, but I can, um, you know, after I maybe mean, tomorrow morning, uh, Steve, I can send you these a uh, couple of things. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of uh, there are a few good um, uh, videos that uh, Edutopia has done. Where they've gone into some schools and they have uh, they have uh, provided some uh, some very nice uh, video uh, uh, case studies of some schools where uh, where they're, where the kids are in you know these aren't staged where the kids are really doing some uh, very very interesting things and where it is not just a uh, a sideline to their uh, to their you know to business as usual. So I can, I'll, uh, I don't know if there's, I don't know what the procedure is here, Steve, but I assume you can post them uh, on your site if you, if you care to do that. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll make that available. Also, uh, we have, uh, uh, we have a uh, paper that uh, defines uh, participatory learning. It's short. It was not meant to be a very long, comprehensive paper, and I'll also send that along because it really uh, uh, defines what we see as the uh, as the as the fundamental uh, elements in it. And it was a paper that was uh, that I vetted with some key people like uh, uh, Jenkins and Didi and some and Lemke and some people who are deeply involved in this. So. Uh, uh, I think it's a good starting point. So I'll also uh, forward that to you tomorrow, Steve. Great, and I'll put those links on my blog post about today's event. And I did, I did put a link in the chat to your video page on the initiative website. Um, Craig wanted to know, why do exemplar schools such as High Tech High not move other schools forward? But 
you got good people. Like you got good questions here. Uh, geez, uh, that's very. That's that's that is a very good and a very important question. I I, I think there are a couple of reasons. One is um, one is that uh, in many of those instances, um, their their mission uh, is really not to do that. The um, the hope oftentimes is that uh, simply by it being there, it will have uh, some degree of catalytic uh, impact and uh, persuasive power, so that it will attract and others to it and give others inspiration for moving in that direction. I'm sure that happens sometimes, but again, I think. Um, that's that does mean that the uh, that the extent to which uh, those programs become a real uh, impetus for change uh, is is limited. There's also a sense that in some of the ones that are high visibility, like high tech, uh, that they have had uh, other resources. That in, you know, and you take you know a lot of people in in school districts would say you know uh, they've had nobody's gonna nobody's gonna give us the kinds of resources they have they are they are just hot house uh, hot house examples uh, they're not they don't they don't correspond to where we are and what we can do uh, so in terms of having a ma in terms of having an impact in a fairly substantial way it doesn't happen but i would not in saying that i don't want to diminish the fact that they uh you know they do kind of keep hope alive in that people see it and they're seeing it can happen and um uh as as the question indicates uh you know, I think behind the question was the idea is um, uh, there should be more like that, and even that, even that is a very, very useful conception, uh, so that we recognize that it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it sets a, um, it does set a kind of goal for us, and it does indicate that you know it is possible, it is possible for it to occur. I think we have time for one more question. Radney asked, does participatory learning include students being involved in the curricular design part of education? Yeah, well, another good question. Geez, they're really good questions. And I wish, you know, as I've seen some of the other questions on the screen, um, uh, uh, the mistake that you made, Steve, was this was supposed to be a four-hour presentation. I was, you know, we should we should be sitting here for four hours, uh, really, because there's so many good questions here that we're not going to get to. But um, yeah, I think it does. Now, again, that's where that's where you start running into the question as to whether or not we're uh, we're going to take it seriously or we just like the words. Um, but uh, there, there, uh, you know, it, it, in, if you take the notion of participatory learning. Really seriously, yes, it would mean that your your in the kids are involved in curricular decisions. Does that mean does that now you can go that you know people say well okay so you mean you're going to just say you're going to turn it over to the kids and say whatever we want to do that's a curriculum. Of course not. That does not mean that. Uh, but it does mean it does mean that they are partners. They are partners. They are participating in creating in their in their learning environment. And by the way, another thing, and, and some schools are doing this, uh, and we've we've uh, written about this also, is uh, participants in uh, forming school policy relative to the use of social media. Uh, I think the kids, I think if the approach to developing the policies for, for social networking and for other, uh, for other uh, digital media is done by having a, you know, a couple of administrators sit in a room and develop the policy and then give it to the board for, uh, superintendent board for approval, I think you're missing the boat. I think the only way that that policy is going to have the policy that we're asking kids to uh, adhere to is if they become stakeholders, and and we're seeing uh, 
you know, we're seeing instances in schools where that is done. I've mentioned one of these just briefly because we're at 9 o'clock, but uh, there's uh, the Birdville School District. I love their mission statement. Their mission statement is very short. Uh, that their, their mission is to enable kids to succeed in a world that they create. Jim, that's a terrific place to stop. Um, and we do try and finish right on the hour so that uh, we're respectful of your time and we really appreciate you coming. I'm clapping for you. There, there was a lot we didn't get to, but what we did get to was fascinating. I really appreciate your work. I do hope that you do get a continuation of the funding to do the research. I really appreciate what you've done. Um, coming up tomorrow, of course, our unschooling panel, where we will talk about what happens when there is no structure, um, and then Cal Newport on uh, how to be a high school superstar. Jim, thanks again. Yeah, I, I thank you to all the. I, I feel very privileged to have had the chance to talk to the. Uh, given what I'm seeing here about the comments, it was a uh, a very very uh, dedicated group who's given up. Up, uh, giving up an evening for this, and I'm uh, I'm honored to have the chance to uh, speak with you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody for coming, Jim. Just to close out, you just click on the red X at the top right of your screen and go to File and Exit. For the rest of you, you probably know the drill. I actually have to clear the room for the recording to process, and as it turns out tonight, I have another engagement, so I do have to go quickly. So uh, we'll thank you again. I hope that you'll come to another session or listen to the recordings. Take care, everybody, and have a good night. Yes, Richard, have a good day. <laughs>